from Redeemer Broadcasting, this is Holding All Things Together for this first weekend in July. I'm Dan Elmendorf. On the Skype line with us today is Andrea Schwartz. She is a writer. She works with Calcedon as a Christian educator and family advocate. She's written eight books and also teaches biblical law to other women. Uh, She's a homeschooler. Andrea, it's an honor to have you on with us today. Thank you. It's really an honor to be with you. I saw a clip online, a short video, where you were talking about homeschooling and the the common objection that, that seems like it always comes back to us homeschoolers is, well, what about socialization? And you've had to deal with that over many years, and I'm wondering if you would be willing to share with our audience today your understanding of socialization and homeschoolers. Certainly. Let me just say, I homeschooled actively for over 28 years. My three children are separated in age. The oldest is 14 years older than the youngest, and I always homeschooled him. So all three of them were taken up through high school. They're all adults now, successful in life in terms of they're not a burden to society. They're not serving out prison sentences. They're contributing to society. And so from my point of view, if you look at the purpose of education being to make people useful to themselves, their family, etc., I think I succeeded in that vein. And when I started, homeschooling wasn't as fashionable or well-known as it is now. Thus, I got a variety of questions over the years. But the question that everybody seems to ask is about socialization. Now, first of all, I'm not even sure most people know what they mean by that question, but they think they're supposed to ask it. Because, you see, socialization is considered the highest good. Sure. Well, socialization socialism. Gee, do those things have anything in common? In other words, does socialization mean that I can expect certain attitudes, behaviors, and opinions from you, and therefore uh, I'll know what to expect of you? Well, when you put somebody into a very controlled environment like the government schools, that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a uniform product, very much like an assembly line. When we go in and buy a car, We hope that the car of this make and model looks just like the one that came off the assembly line. But I don't believe that's what we're called to be as people. And certainly, we are made in God's image, and the whole purpose of education from a Christian perspective is to make people more like God rather than more like the state. Mm. And so, if we look at socialization as responding to the bell when it rings – being told, stand in line when I tell you to stand in line. By the way, everybody knows that. Well, I specifically didn't want that for my children. One of the reasons that I emphasize biblical law, not only in the homeschool curriculum, but for the homeschool teacher, is that's the thing that should be the standard by which we judge right or wrong, good or bad, profitable or unprofitable. And I often joke that one of the most dangerous things you can do is teach your children biblical law because one day they may come up and say, Mom and Dad, I don't think you're following what the Word of God (laughs) says here. And you have to be able to take the correction if the correction is due. Well, let's just even forget about the socialistic mechanisms that are in the state schools. Currently, the one thing that really is not permissible in state schools is the name of Jesus Christ – and saying Jesus Christ has the way, the truth, and the life, and that's what we repair to as what's right and wrong, and it still can be right if 99% of the people in the same room with me think it's wrong. Yeah, so true. I really like your analogy to a a uniform uh, assembly line, a uniform product coming out. And uh, we've found, I'm sure you have too, that each of our children is, is so different, and each of them have unique callings and gifts, and the homeschooled environment allow them to develop these callings. Indeed. And you see, if you divorce yourself from the evolutionary model, which is the prevailing model in science and in education today, and you instead go to the biblical model that people are made uniquely, and there's no two people who are exactly the same, and God's creative work is manifested, 
So the fact that a musician like Bach produced things that I did not is a testimony to God's creation. But I have a calling that's unique to me. And so education that's geared toward godliness and then recognizing the unique qualities God placed in individuals. That's why I always laugh when people are saying, oh, you have a boy or a girl. You have one of each. Well, you can have 10 girls and have not one of each. They're all (laughs) going to be different. And the reason that the family is so important is because the family is invested in these are my children and I'm going to help them develop the best they can be. You take the best teachers anywhere and they're not going to have that same unique love and care that you're going to find in the family. Maybe you found this true also um, as the children developed and as they found their life's callings, um, they became better in those spheres of life than I was. You know, For example, one would say, Daddy, how do I do a website? Well, I don't know how you do a website, but between him and me and my wife, Deb, um, we got him tied in to the right people, and now he's a top-notch web designer. Uh, <laughs> you know, And these kids can take it a lot further than what you can. And even though you, you are teaching them, you're giving them the opportunities and, and giving them the, the tools by which to make these uh, advances. Because parents are in a stewardship role, not an ownership role. We don't own our children. Our children are owned by God as we are owned by God, right? So we want to encourage faithfulness so that they receive God's blessings. But I know you have grown children and you have grandchildren, as do I. Is it not cool to be able to go to your child and ask for advice Yeah. in an area that they're specifically trained and good in and that All you did was say, yeah, go ahead. I remember one of my children thought that she had to do a particular thing, and she came to me and said, what would you think if I pursued economics? And she was sort of embarrassed by the (laughs) question. I said, well, why would I – first of all, do you want to pursue economics? Yes, I do. Well, then you should do it. (laughs) And her reaction was, really? And I said, well, of course. (laughs) If you have the interest and you have the capability – Another child, you know, wanted to go into medicine. Okay, is that what you want to do? And I would always try to instill, you know that you're where God wants you to be if when it gets hard, you still want to do it. Oh, that's so true. Now, in the two minutes remaining, you've written about eight books. Can you describe what they are and how listeners get a hold of them? Certainly. You can go to calcedon.edu and click on store and you'll be able to find my books. But two of them, Lessons Learned from Years of Homeschooling and The Homeschool Life, are meant to encourage people to get started and continue in a homeschool journey. Then I focus, two on the family. One is called The Biblical Trustee Family, and the other is called A House for God. And that's meant to give the family biblical bolstering in the face of a culture that likes to demean and devalue the family. And two books were specifically written to women. One was called Woman of the House, and the other was called Empowered, in terms of getting a biblical understanding of the role of women. It's not on the one extreme that says women are a doormat and are good for nothing else other than just dropping out babies to the other end of extreme feminism that says there should be no gender differentiation. So I tried to bring about a biblical understanding. And then I think my two favorites are the read aloud storybooks that I wrote, one called Teach Me While My Heart is Tender and the other one called Family Matters, that took instances in our life And I put them into stories. And I tell people I changed the names to protect the guilty because these all happened in our house. But I (laughs) thought it'd be better to give them different names in different circumstances and how we dealt with things like repentance and forgiveness and self-discipline and responsibility. Well, thank you so very much. Andrea Schwartz with Calcedon, Christian Education and Family Advocate. It's a real joy to talk with you today. Well, it's been a pleasure, and if anybody would like to contact me, my email is andrea at calcedon, C-H-A-L-C-E-D-O-N dot E-D-U. Well, thank you.